You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. Hello, and welcome to episode 371 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. When Christopher Columbus arrived in, quote, the New World in 1492, he and his fellow Spaniards arrived in a place where slavery already existed. Long before European arrival, indigenous peoples and nations practiced enslavement. Now, their version of enslavement looked different from the version that Christopher Columbus and his fellow Europeans practiced. But indigenous slavery also shared many similarities with the Euro-American practice of African chattel slavery. While there is no way to measure the exact impact of slavery upon the indigenous peoples of the Americas, we do know that the practice involved many millions of indigenous people who were captured, bound, and sold as enslaved people. Estevan Real Galvez, an anthropologist, historian, and historical consultant, joins us to discuss a new digital project designed to tell the stories of the indigenous enslaved. This digital project is called Native Bound, Unbound, Archive of Indigenous Slavery. Now, as we explore the Native Bound, Unbound project, Estevan reveals the goals of the Native Bound, Unbound digital archive and why Estevan and his team started this project. The origins of European-controlled indigenous slavery in the Americas and details about the scope of indigenous slavery and why this topic is not a more well-known part of United States history. But first, The Colonial Williamsburg Foundation runs the world's largest museum dedicated to helping you investigate and explore the history and origins of the United States. As the world's largest United States history museum, Colonial Williamsburg always has a lot of research, activities, and programming taking place all year round. To stay up to date with what Colonial Williamsburg and its scholars are discovering about the past and to explore its wide range of activities and programming, sign up for one of its email lists at benfranklinsworld.com slash cwsubscribe. Again, to sign up for one of Colonial Williamsburg's email lists, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash cwsubscribe. All right, are you ready to investigate the practice of indigenous slavery and discover more about this exciting new digital project about it? Let's go meet our guest historian. Our guest is an anthropologist, historian, and cultural consultant. He has worked as a senior vice president at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, as executive director at the National Hispanic Cultural Center, and as a state historian of New Mexico. His research focuses on recovering the lives and histories of indigenous peoples who experienced enslavement. And at present, he is the founder and executive director of the digital project Native Bound Unbound, Archive of Indigenous Slavery. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Estevan Real Galvez. I'm so pleased to be here with you, Liz. And we're pleased to have you, Estevan. Now, I know we're going to talk a lot about your exciting new digital project, Native Bound, Unbound, but we've never spoken with a state historian before. So before we get into your digital work, would you tell us about your work as the state historian of New Mexico? What kind of work does a state historian do? It depends on what the legislation says for each state, but I could tell you certainly about the amazing things I was able to work on when I was a state historian of New Mexico, which was, I think, about 14 years ago now. Officially, it's a leadership position at the New Mexico State Archives, so it oversees that part of the commission. Also, generally, the person who holds the position serves as the chair of the Historic Preservation Commission that oversees historic preservation across the entire state. Something I learned and relished in and became immersed in, I like to say that I became the accidental preservationist. But I think that gave me a very particular vantage to think about the power of place and about how to include stories that were not being included, even in a place like New Mexico. Initially, I developed a scholars-in-residence program, one of the most robust internship programs 
And in terms of accessibility to documents and knowledge, I started dabbling early on in 2003 with digital humanities. And I launched what was then called the New Mexico Digital History Project. We probably digitized 6 million items, both audio, documents, artifacts. And we developed a public website that won a couple of national awards. I was really proud of that project. It's no longer accessible, but it was one of the things I was most proud of when I did that position. Digital humanities, archives, preservation. Esteban, it sounds like being the state historian of New Mexico set you up nicely for the digital project you're operating now, which is Native Bound, Unbound. It's true, that position in particular, but I think everything I have done in my professional life has led me to this moment to create this project, which is both deeply personal and professional. Certainly, I think the impetus of the present project, in a way, began decades ago. It's part of my research work for the dissertation, which was focused on Native American slavery here regionally. I built what I believe we would refer to as a relational database. Using family tree software, I used that as a mechanism to incorporate data that I was gathering from church records, census records, civil and criminal records. And the work that I'm doing now is an expanded version and implementation of that. Even my work at the National Trust has contributed to the way I'm thinking about how do we document place? How do we use technology to understand places that are often circumscribed to the most marginal, including the enslaved? Certainly more recently, I managed another Mellon Foundation project building on community-based archiving. So all of these projects. But it's brought me to this project that I think I was born to do this. Would you tell us about this project that you were born to do, the Native Bound Unbound project? What exactly is Native Bound Unbound? And what is the personal story that prompted you to start this project? It's imagined as an interactive multimedia interdisciplinary website, but underneath that public website that we eventually will launch over the next year, I hope, we're building a centralized digital repository, all centered on the lives of enslaved indigenous people. As the project develops, it will serve as a platform for activating that collection, transforming data but eventually it will be amplified through digital exhibitions, chronologies. And I hope that people will be able to access it for advancing new scholarship. And I hope it will be a major source for educators, scholars, storytellers. So it's a digital repository where we are gathering digital assets. Those assets will include documents, but they'll also include artifacts, oral histories, all types of content. And all of it will be accessible through a public website. The personal story. I have been thinking about indigenous slavery since I was a little boy. When I curled into my great-grandmother Dulcinea Ariano when we would visit her in Pueblo, Colorado, she told the same story every time we visited her. And in fact, we recently found a recording that was done in the 1980s of her, and that recording includes part of the story. She told of an ancestor that she only could refer to as La India Panana. I didn't know what that meant then, but it was an indigenous Pawnee ancestor who had been captured by an enemy tribe and is taken, as she pointed with her lips, down south. And she told another man, a Mexican man who had also been captured by that tribe, if you take me with you, I will show you how to escape. And according to the story, they escaped. They ended up in a village just north of Taos, New Mexico, called Arroyo Hondo. And I descend from that couple. Another story that was told on my mother's side of the family was told along with two artifacts. My mother had inherited across the generations two blankets that were attributed to a woman who was known as Nanacela Manuelita Cisneros a Diné, a Navajo woman who had been taken as a child, learned to weave with a master's loom, and those two blankets were handed down from one generation to the next. 
until one is hung above my dining room table to remind me of that story every day. And the third story, I think it was 1977, when Roots became a syndicated television series. And this little boy growing up in northern New Mexico sat down with my brother and my parents to watch that night after night, deeply impressing upon me the importance of the legacy of slavery in a very different context, obviously, from the one that I would explore. But those stories of La India Panana, of Nanacela, and of people like Kunta Kinte and Kizzy, and all of those characters that emerged from Alex Haley's roots deeply impressed on me the importance of telling a different story. So I went on and wrote a dissertation about this. So the Native Bound Unbound Project is really a digital archive that collects and curates historical documents related to indigenous slavery. And eventually, the public-facing website that you talked about will make this data collection, these archive sources available to people. Esteban, since we are talking about indigenous slavery Would you provide us with an overview of the enslavement of indigenous peoples in early America? Is the enslavement of indigenous people something that Europeans did to indigenous people? Or was this something that indigenous people also did to other indigenous people? Indigenous slavery really predated the arrival of Europeans in the Americas. But at the moment, our focus is beginning in 1492. And I think of that first known document commemorating Christopher Columbus's voyage in 1492. And that document was written in 1493. But he notes in that letter, when I arrived at the Indies in the first island, which I found, I took some natives by force. From them, we might gain some information of what was in these parts. It's not known how many men, women, children Columbus captured in that first voyage. But when he was received in Barcelona by the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabel, among the gifts presented before those monarchs were six indios, six indigenous individuals who survived that passage, including a young boy from the island of Guarani. Every European nation that was involved in the colonization of the Americas, from the Dutch, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the British, and the Spanish, were involved in this indigenous slave trade from that moment in 1492 all the way into the early 20th century when people who had been captured in the 19th century were still being held in places like Colorado and New Mexico as late as the 1940s and 50s, still being held in the homes of the grandchildren of their former enslavers still being recognized with the terms servant, which I refer to as a euphemism for slavery. So we're interested in documenting every single instance of enslavement across the Americas, regardless of who did the capturing and enslavement. Esteban, when you told us the story about your personal connections to the Native Bound Unbound Project, You mentioned that you and your family sat down to watch Roots in the 1970s, and that all of a sudden you're looking at slavery from a different vantage point because you were watching this film about African slavery, all the while thinking about your ancestors who were enslaved as indigenous people. Now that you're all grown up and you've had all of your historical experience and training, do you think indigenous slavery was similar to the ways that Europeans and early Americans enslaved Africans and African Americans? I think of what historian Andres Rusendas has noted. It was a parallel system of bondage, as degrading and vast as African slavery. There are differences, but the more we explore and gather details across regions and time periods, Liz, we're actually seeing more in common than we are seeing differences. Certainly the main difference under various empires is the legality of the trait. Under the Spanish Empire, indigenous slavery was made illegal in 1542, but it continued. It continued with a different language and, as I say, under a tolerated illegality, thus rendering it much more invisible than African slavery. One of the terms that is often used by slavery scholars in the United States especially, not in places like Peru or Argentina, but certainly in the United States, 
is the transatlantic slave trade. I have already told you a story about 1492, about six individuals who were carried across the Atlantic. In 1495, Columbus loaded up a ship of 500 indigenous people. So the transatlantic slave trade was not just Africans coming into the Americas, but indigenous people being carried into places all across Europe, into London, into Madrid, and beyond. The other term that is often used is chattel slavery, to refer to African slavery, which is nothing more than treating people like property, right? Like the hooved animals. One of my favorite documents to explore in thinking about this project are last wills and testaments and the inventories that we're finding in those last wills and testaments, whether a document from the 1500s that we've recently been translating from Peru or last wills and testaments that I've looked at here in New Mexico, shows people being willed and given across generations like their movable property, just like chattel. So again, when I said in answering your question to begin with, there are more similarities than there are differences. It's important to talk about the issue of race and tribe and all of those distinctions And it's also important to think about the different regions, right? So Mexico is different from Brazil. Brazil is different from Colorado and California. Virginia is different than Texas. So as we immerse ourselves in this research, it's teasing out those differences and contextualizing it as best as we can. Speaking of the need to talk about race, tribe, and other distinctions, when we talk about African slavery, We talk about people who were forcibly brought across the Atlantic Ocean from Africa to the Americas. And these Africans hailed from all over Africa. And while they may have been enslaved in family and friend groups, once they arrived in the Americas, they were usually dispersed and separated from the people that they knew. So without friends, family, and a lot of other people who spoke their African language or participated in their African cultures, lots of enslaved people had to create and learn new Creole languages and European languages so that they could speak with one another. And they also had to create new cultures as the act of enslavement really separated them from their people, histories, and cultures. Is the same sort of cultural creation and language creation among the similarities that you find between African and indigenous slaveries? Did indigenous people experience the same sort of familial and cultural separation as enslaved people who were brought in from the African diasporas? All we can do is look at the documents and as much as possible try to contextualize and understand what those experiences might have been like. But I do think even in this context here of New Mexico, there's a document from 1733. It's individuals who, by this point, they had been captured and held within communities over 20 years. They have now been given the ability to settle their own lands, so they've been tentatively freed, so to speak, but they're listed by multiple nations, Kiowa, Apache, Comanche, all of these different nations that they're being thrown together in their various indigenous communities that have their own worldviews, their own languages, their own geographic understanding of the world. And they're all thrown together as little kids, and even as adults, may not understand one another at all. But they're all forced into the same slave regime and made to serve their enslavers in this same geography. I'm also curious about the legalities of slavery and how those may have varied by the enslaver's empire. So in the case of African slavery, at least in the English, Dutch, and French contexts, the condition of servitude followed that of the mother. So if a woman had a baby while she was enslaved, then her child would also be enslaved. And this is known as the doctrine of partis sequitur ventrum. So Esteban, was this doctrine of partis sequitur ventrum also implied to indigenous people who were enslaved by different European empires? It varies by region and varies by time period. So I have actually traced individuals here in New Mexico who are captured and enslaved, and it appears from the records that their children 
also inherit that same status. It's one of the points that slavery scholars have indicated are differences between the African slave trade and the indigenous slave trade. But again, it depends on the circumstance, the region, and the time period. We're seeing both issues reflected in the documents. And what kinds of documents are you finding in archives and entering into the Native Bound Unbound Slavery Archive project? Because we talk about the documents as we discuss different answers to different questions. So I wonder if you would tell us about the types of documents, the types of historical documents that reveal information about enslaved Indigenous people. Oh my gosh, there's so many documents, Liz, that we are gathering. So records that reveal these experiences currently exist in archival repositories around the globe. And they include legal cases, so criminal, civil cases, censuses, letters, last wills and testaments, newspapers, photographs, church records. Church records, I think, are going to be the largest extent type of document baptisms, marriages, burials. But we're not only thinking of records, right? So we're thinking that museums hold tapestries, pottery, and more that reflect indigenous slavery. Individuals and families hold personal records, objects, artifacts, photographs, and stories that have been passed down. So that's really what this Project Native Bound is doing, collecting all of that digitally so that we can show these various archival imprints and how they reflect as a collective the broader issue of indigenous slavery. Now, you describe Native Bound Unbound as an interactive multimedia project. And I think we can get some sense of that with the different types of paper records and physical objects that you're collecting in this digital archive. What about oral histories? A lot of indigenous peoples keep their histories and records through word of mouth sharing and oral stories and verbal lessons that they pass down from one family member to the next, just like your great grandmother did. Is the Native Bound Unbound Archive handling oral histories in any way? Yes. In fact, I've been working with our programmers lately to figure out exactly how to include, because we must, multimedia, videos, audio. I mentioned the recording I found of my great-grandmother sharing a story about an ancestor. I also found a story that was recorded in the 1970s with a man in southern Colorado talking about the number of indigenous enslaved people his father held. So if we can find those recordings, we will find a way to actually share them on the site and connect them to particular people. But I am super excited that we announced a partnership with StoryCorps, where we will be gathering descendant stories, really conversations between pairs of individuals. And we've identified about 10 pairs of individuals throughout New Mexico who want to share stories about known ancestors, how they came to know about those ancestors, either through research or oral histories, and what that means to them to be a descendant. So absolutely, we will include oral histories in this project. As I imagine you in StoryCorps out in the world collecting these stories, it's a fun image, by the way. And as I think about all of the different historical records that you've already collected for your digital archive, your digital archive must span a lot of different languages because you have a lot of indigenous languages and then you have the language of each European empire. Esteban, As you're building your digital archive project for people like us who are interested in history, but we're not scholars of indigenous history or historians who know a lot of languages, for people like us who are just interested in the past, are you going to have English translations or records available so that we can read all of the wonderful things that are going into your archive or listen to all of the wonderful records that are going into your archive? Yes, 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 yes. Let me just say that we are working with research associates who are gathering material in Canada and Brazil, so certainly working on French records and Portuguese records, and certainly in other regions of the United States, which English, right? Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, Massachusetts, and much more. And even those early colonial British records, they have to be transcribed, right? because it's a type of English either written in a certain vernacular, but still because accessibility is so important to us, 
we are fully transcribing all of these records, but we're also committed to translating them. So not only am I already thinking about translating Spanish records or French or Portuguese records into English, this is a hemispheric project, Liz, and I'm deeply committed to accessibility. It certainly will require other grant funding in this, but why wouldn't we take a Spanish record and translate it into French or an English document into Portuguese? No promises yet, but that's really where my commitment is to making it fully accessible to all types of people. A central goal of the Native Bound Unbound Project, as it's stated on the project's website, is to create the archive of the indigenous enslaved across the Americas, name by name and story by story. We've been talking a lot about indigenous slavery very broadly. So after we take a moment for our episode sponsor, I'd like for us to hear about some of the names and stories that Estevan has uncovered in his research about indigenous slavery. For nearly a century, Colonial Williamsburg has been a place of inspiration by discovering, curating, and presenting early American history through innovative and compelling programming. In 2026, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation will celebrate the United States' 250th anniversary as well as its own centennial. Through the power of place, the centennial campaign for Colonial Williamsburg. Colonial Williamsburg will expand its mission to reach and inspire people by investing in preservation, education, and civic engagement. They're investing in programming and work like Ben Franklin's World and the Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. With your support, Colonial Williamsburg can achieve its mission to inspire people across the country and around the globe. For more information about The Power of Place, the centennial campaign for Colonial Williamsburg, and how you can help support programs and initiatives like Ben Franklin's World and the Innovation Studios. Visit benfranklinsworld.com slash power of place. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash power of place. Esteban, would you share with us some of the names and stories from early America that you've uncovered in your quest to learn more about indigenous slavery? In answering this question, I think of the commemorative memorials and events that call upon those present to call the names of their victim, say their names, whether of the Holocaust, African-American slavery, 9-11. And at the heart of MBU, it's not so different from those efforts as well. It's an effort to identify those names, even in all of their complexity and contradiction, because mostly what we have are slave names. But as one individual who was recorded in 1934, when asked, isn't this a slave name, he said, it's my name. It's the name that I know. So we're deeply committed to recovering the names and certainly the stories behind them. I could spend, and the project will spend hours saying their names or recording them, but I want to just say maybe a few of them. I think of Tituba the Arawakina woman caught up in the Salem witch trials of 1692, 1693. I think any of us who have studied the Salem witch trials may not have realized Tituba was one of these indigenous enslaved women. So I want to say her name, Tituba. I think of King George, not the King George that some of your listeners may think of, but the man whose obituary was printed in 1913 where he is identified as, quote, one of the last living slaves of the Alaska natives, having been captured and brought to Alaska over 60 years ago by the Klawak tribe, returning from a plundering expedition down the Canadian territory. I think of my own ancestor, Doña Inez, one of the earliest known individuals enslaved, taken in 1591 from less than 50 miles away from where I'm talking to you today in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Let me repeat that, 1591, from her Puebloan community in the New Mexico Galisteo Basin and taken into Mexico City, turned into a convent, and then returned in 1598 as part of an expedition to settle New Mexico in that year. I think of Antonia, the indigenous woman purchased and held here in Santa Fe, who is my ancestor, who is simply listed in a 1750 census as India. I can go on and on and on. Thank you for sharing those names. Now, Esteban, as we've stated, 
The Native Bound Unbound Project is creating a digital archive of Indigenous slavery. Why do you think it's critical that we find records about Indigenous enslavement and digitize those records so that they're centralized in one place and more widely available to anyone who would like to access them? The very simple answer is accessibility. While scholars have done a magnificent job of pooling at primary source material, as we begin to identify these documents one by one, I know that thousands of documents, perhaps countless documents, remain obscured in boxes and folders throughout Europe and the Americas. I know those documents haven't seen the light of day maybe when they were created in the 1500s or 1700s or 1800s. I know that because I know the field and scholars can only use so many examples when they're writing their books, right? But we intend to pull those documents out of boxes, scan them so that people can see them online. And as I said earlier, we're going to transcribe them and translate them. By doing that, again, back to the imperative of accessibility, it not only reveals a more nuanced, more complex story of the hemisphere and of the United States of America, but it allows us to know these histories. I heard an interview recently between Oprah and Nicole Hannah-Jones, the creator of the 1619 Project, who both acknowledge the idea that the American public just does not know these histories. By making these documents more accessible, I hope the knowledge will shift the narratives and eventually hopefully shift the consciousness of who we are as a nation, who we are as a community, as a people. Once the Native Bound Unbound Project makes these different historical sources and documents available, and you said that some of these documents may be available before the end of the year, once you make these written and other types of sources available, how do you hope people will use this archive and the information within it. I know many of us come to history through genealogy, so have you imagined people conducting genealogical and historical research in your database? How do you imagine people using this project? Oh my gosh. I think of the multiple types of users. I think of scholars, right? I think it will begin to amplify that type of scholarship. So scholars will suddenly be able to draw upon the information. I think of educators, right? So I hope to be able to get another grant or get more financial support because once we gather all of this data and content, I hope to be able to pull together curriculum units to support educators across the United States and beyond to actually be able to talk more about and show the documents, have their students begin to work with them. I think of artists, all types of creators who I hope will be able to draw from the material to create television series, movies, operas, novels. I'm glad that you mentioned genealogies because when the president of the Mellon Foundation asked me, who are you doing this for? Because it's going to be open to the general public. I want everyone to learn from it. But my answer was singular. We are doing this for descendant communities. So when people use it, they can actually just look up a name. If they look up Josefa Romero, they can look up all of the Romeros. If they're interested in finding all the Comanches, they will be able to just do a search for that. It will also be curated for those people who just want to navigate through and actually understand how many people in the 1700s across the hemisphere were enslaved. There are multiple ways in which we use it, but I certainly am always thinking of descendants who actually may want to be able to try to find an ancestor. Do you have a sense of how many indigenous people were enslaved? There have been a few estimates based on some of the records that people have started to explore. Andres Resendez, for instance, has estimated, I think, about 5 million if I remember correct from glancing at an index he has at the back of his book, The Other Slavery. But here's the reality. I think it's going to be millions, many, many millions, because the research that we have to date that Andres and maybe other historians are drawing from are primarily baptismal records. And as we start to expand that into burials and marriages and civic and census records, that number 
will increase exponentially. This is not about numbers. It's about people. I'm mindful of not letting this be simply about numbers of people that are listed in a document because, in a way, it abstracts their experience. It's going to be important for us to think about this in a much more respectful way. It's true that I think it'll reveal astronomical, unexpected numbers. But for every name and experience that is recovered and placed into context, there's an individual behind that. And for me, it's about honoring those individuals. It also sounds like this archive of indigenous slavery could also be a place of community, where if you are doing genealogical research and you find yourself to be part of a descendant community, you might find relatives and ancestors that you never knew you had. Absolutely. It's about connectivity, not just connecting the past to the present, ancestors to descendants, but about kinship. I happen to have led a community-based conversation in El Paso. We had, I don't know, about 30 people gathered there. And the invitation that I extended to the community was to be able to share ancestor stories of people who they knew about had discovered through research or through an oral history that had been passed down. We needed boxes of Kleenex, first of all, because it was a powerful clearing where people were able to share testimonies, to speak power to those names and to those experiences. But what was also powerful to me, Liz, was one story invited the next, invited the next. And really, that's one of the promises, I hope, for Native Bound Unbound, that it will not only connect cousins and kin, but I think it will create connections that we weren't even expecting. Earlier, you mentioned how Oprah and Nicole Hannah-Jones discussed that people in the United States don't really understand the histories of slavery. And Rosemary noted something similar. She says that for many Americans, the existence of indigenous slavery is really missing from our understanding about the early American past. And she believes that this is in large part because it's a subject so rarely taught in our classrooms. So Estevan, Rosemary wonders if you have any ideas about why the enslavement of indigenous peoples by non-indigenous peoples has been mostly erased from our history books. I do. First, this points to part of the way history is taught and consumed in the United States. I was raised and schooled in southern Colorado, northern New Mexico, so I'm part of that. And the 13 colonies is almost always recognized as the origin point, and everything flows from there east to west. But I would invite your listeners to think more critically about geography and history, and much more expansively. If we think of the present geography of the United States, that is, the places that are now part of the United States, Places like Florida, New Mexico, California, Puerto Rico, Louisiana, Missouri. Just to mention a few, these places were settled under different empires. Spanish and French, and in some cases those settlements are older than the British colonies. So it's important to think critically about what is colonial American history, first of all. And because history is often taught that way, The history of those places is often not considered to be part of the nation's history. I often think about where I grew up here in New Mexico, Liz, and I think when the United States conquered the northern part of Mexico and took this land in a war of aggression in 1848, and the people and the land and the resources here, I picture them holding suitcases in that moment. And the nation said, okay, you are all now part of the nation. But those suitcases were our history from this region. You conquered us, you get our history as well. You can't just talk about post-1848. You get all the way back to 1530 when Estevanico comes in to this land. The nation inherits it all. I think that's part of the reason it gets erased. There are others. The erasure also is a result of the specific dynamics endemic to indigenous slavery. As I said earlier, under the Spanish Empire, Indian slavery was prohibited in 1542, except under a few circumstances. 
though it continued as a tolerated illegality. But the reality was, because of that, it was obscured and silenced. And so people just don't know. It sounds like a major goal of the Native Bound Unbound Archive of Indigenous Slavery is really to make the stories of Indigenous slavery and those who were enslaved more visible. Esteban, how do you think our understanding of American history will change as these stories become more visible? I think people will be surprised to learn how parallel it is, as Professor Resendez has said. They'll be surprised to know the numbers. They'll be surprised to know figures like I mentioned Titaba and others were part of that slavery regime. It'll start to change how we think about the foundations of our nation in the same way, I hope, because one of my inspirations is the 1619 Project, I think will change how we think about origins. It will change how we think about identity. And it may also help us see early American history from a West to East vantage point. Yes, I hope so. (laughs) I hope so. Now we should move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Esteban, in your opinion, what if the Native Bound Unbound Digital Archive had actually been available 30 years ago? How do you think our understanding of early American history would be different? Oh, I love this question, Liz. 30 years ago was 1993. And while you've asked a broader question, I can't help but reflect on a personal level. I, at the time, that was my second year of graduate school. I was also in law school. Long story but just beginning to immerse myself into the research. And if this database had existed then, it would have been transformative in my own research. Instead, I began to create a database on my own. So who knows how it would have changed my own trajectory. I would have maybe been able to go even deeper in the interpretive realm. Thinking about things in a broader way, I wouldn't have had to have spent as much time finding the documents, transcribing, translating. But to the broader question, you have gone right to what I believe is really critical to the promise embodied in this project. That more than a series of scholarly books and monographs which have their place, some more than others have attempted to shift the national narrative, I hope this project and the data it would have revealed 30 years ago would have started to shift that national narrative. If not the data alone, perhaps it would have begun to inspire new stories. God knows the new type of scholarly books, novels, operas, movies, TV series that would have begun to have emerged over the past 30 years. But that's a promise I hold for the next 30. So the Native Bound Unbound project is not yet publicly available. Would you tell us more about when we'll be able to access this project and make use of its historical records? Ah, gosh, I hate to promise an exact date. I keep saying, over the next year. And, you know, part of it is that it's going to be a project in process for multiple decades. It's never going to be complete. But at the same time, we do want to launch it, right? We want people to start using it as soon as possible. And the researchers are as anxious as the programmers who we've engaged because they've been working really hard for the past year. So we're in the process now of building the backend repository, and we've started the parallel process of building the public-facing website. So I hope over the next year, we'll start to showcase some of the content that we've been gathering over the past year and probably a year and a half by that point. Now, while the Native Bound Unbound project is not yet available for us to use, I understand that you do need volunteers, Estevan, and that it's possible for us to get involved with the project. So would you tell us more about how we can get involved with the Native Bound Unbound project? Oh, yes, please. Thank you for that. We need every heart, hand, mind working with us on this project. You can write to us direct at info, I-N-F-O, at nativeboundunbound.org. 
info at nativeboundunbound.org. So that's one of the easiest ways to do this. There is one element of our project which often gets confused for our website, but it's just one element where we have invited volunteer transcribers, people working in paleography, to work with us on documents to transcribe them. That's at a portal called From the Page, and if you just Google Native Bound Unbound, you'll find your way there. But even at that, I would say, please write to us at info at nativeboundunbound.org. Esteban, are you conducting research for any particular aspect or story of indigenous slavery as you work to build the Native Bound Unbound archive? We're conducting all types of research. We're interested in family and gender and labor and types of raids. I don't want to leave a stone untouched or a box unopened. And the contextualization of this, we are looking at language, we're looking at vocabulary. There's probably not a single element of indigenous enslavement that I would not be interested in incorporating in the project. If we have more questions about indigenous slavery or the Native Bound Unbound Project, or if we think we might have an ancestor who was enslaved and we'd like to make sure that their stories are included in this archive, how can we get in touch with you? By all means, info at nativeboundunbound.org. I also would invite your listeners to follow us on social media at NAT Bound Unbound. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And right now you can see some of the exciting work that we're already engaged in there. But please, I would welcome anyone either volunteering or sharing documents or information that they would have on an ancestor. Esteban Real Galvez, thank you so much for joining us and for telling us more about indigenous slavery and the Native Bound Unbound Project. Liz, I am so honored that you've asked me to share these stories and be part of this podcast, truly. Indigenous slavery involved millions of people. The Native Bound Unbound Digital Archive of Indigenous Slavery is working to give voice to the indigenous enslaved by searching for and collecting the stories of as many indigenous enslaved people as scholars and ancestors can find. But more than just collecting the stories of the indigenous enslaved, the Native Bound Unbound Project is looking to create a space for connectivity. Esteban and his team hope that their site will serve as a place where descendants of the indigenous enslaved can find each other. They also hope that their website will be a place where communities can form, heal, and flourish. When we learn and talk about slavery within the United States, we almost always talk and think about African chattel slavery. That was the practice of slavery Europeans brought to and developed within the Americas. It was also the practice of slavery that led the United States into a long and bloody civil war during the 1860s, when Americans fought over whether slavery was compatible with the nation's founding ideals of liberty, freedom, and equality. As Estevan noted, African chattel slavery was a parallel practice of slavery. Although practices of indigenous slavery predated the practice of African chattel slavery, the two systems of slavery operated alongside one another. So why don't we learn more about indigenous slavery in school and in our history books? As Estevan revealed, we don't learn more about it because of the way our understandings of United States history have developed. As we heard from Michael Haddam in episode 307, historians began writing the first histories of the United States right after the American Revolution. As the nation was then limited to the eastern seaboard, that was where their histories began, with the 13 British American colonies that had rebelled against the British Empire and won their independence. As the nation grew and expanded west, our history books and lessons continued apace by adding only the stories of how new states came to join the existing Union. No accommodation was ever made to rejigger the nation's chronology or its colonial history to include the timelines, peoples, and events that fell outside of the United States' origins in British North America. The United States is a nation that looks at its history from east to west. But much can be learned if we also look at its history from west to east. Looking at early American history from this western vantage point allows us to tell a more complete story of the United States' origins. It also allows us to see the broader picture of the nation's full colonial past and also its rich and very full indigenous origins and history. You will find more information about Estevan the Native Bound Unbound Project, plus notes, links, and a transcript for everything we talked about today 
on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 371. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So if you enjoy Ben Franklin's World, please tell your friends and family about it. Production assistance for this podcast comes from my colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. Joseph Edelman, Katie Schinebeck, Ashley Bachnight Claybrooks, and Ian Tonat. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, the Innovation Studios team and I would love your input and ideas for topics that we can explore in early American history from a Western perspective. Let us know about the history in your area that you think more people should know about. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. <laughs>